Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. I'm Karen and I'm an alcoholic. And it's truly through the grace of God and the power of Alcoholics Anonymous that I've been sober since May 30th, 1982. And that does not make me a miracle. It makes Alcoholics Anonymous a miracle. And if you're new here tonight, I want to welcome you to AA. And I always call it God's Magnificent AA, the program that saved my life and it's going to save yours too, if you want to take a few quick actions. And I suggest strongly to the sponsor tonight that you get that book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and you get busy. Everybody else is doing around here. And you stay sober as I've stayed sober for 22 years. And people like me cannot stay sober, I can guarantee you. My home group is the Pacific Group in West L.A., a group I'm very, very proud to be a member of, just as I'm sure you're proud to be a member of yours. And I guess if you're not proud, you ought to get a job and you might change your mind. I certainly have a job in mind, and I'm proud to have that job. I want to thank Chris for inviting me to come out. This is an honor and a privilege. It's one that I do not take lightly, I'll guarantee you. You guys, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I really do. And I think that it shows, and I make an awful lot of mistakes. I do an awful lot of things wrong. But I'll tell you one thing, that I love you. Make no mistake about that. You know, I've been talking an awful lot of things before I ever opened my big mouth. And one thing is talk to my sponsor. And Clancy sent you his love and very best wishes tonight. And Jamie in these rooms is wondering why I have a man for a sponsor. My Clancy for a sponsor. It's really quite simple. I did not get sober in California. I got sober in a place called Lincoln, Nebraska. And was not doing well now, like Thomas in Lincoln, Nebraska. I went through 19 sponsors at a rapid clip. And I'm certainly not proud of it as I stand here tonight. And thank God for the old timers in A because somebody loved me enough to get my current sponsor. And I can tell you that my life has done nothing but totally complete trials with all that. And I obviously adore the ground that man walks. And I talked to him this morning. He said, almost every single day of my life. And he said, where are you going? I said, Portland, Oregon. And he said, well, get up there and share your experience, your strength, and your hope. And, and tell those people what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Ignore the old timers. They got it. They don't need your inspiration, my dear. And, and talk directly to those new people of the life and blood of AA. And, and I believe that as I stand here and I welcome you and I hope that you stay in. Then I think I did without a doubt the most important thing I can ever do. And that's to say, God, please help me say what you want me to say to these people. God is very much a part of my life tonight. You guys are not used to be that way with me, I can guarantee you. I come from an alcoholic hell. I cannot even describe it was so bad. And, you know, my life is real good today, and sometimes I forget how bad it was. And I can tell you, the day I got sober, I weighed 95 pounds. I was the color of squash. I had an alcoholic hepatitis. I had a liver cirrhosis. I had rupture esophageal varices. And if you don't know what that stuff is, you don't want to know because you die from that kind of stuff. And I was standing on Skid Row in Lincoln, Nebraska, sucking on a bottle of Mad Dog. And if you guys haven't drank Mad Dog, I need to tell you it's not one of your finer wines, I can assure you. Uh, I'll guarantee you one thing, that crap has never seen a great, make no mistake about that. And I uh, literally could not believe what's gone in my life. I'd lost my children. I'd lost my husband twice. I don't really care about that, I want you to know. I'd lost my car. I'd lost my house. I destroyed every relationship. I'd ever have with anybody, and I was clearly dying from alcoholism. And then I lost the one thing that brought my knees and disease. I lost my nursing license. And you guys, I love my profession. Absolutely devastated me, but not stopped me from drinking. And there's a reason for that, and it's in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, because I have an obsession that somehow, someday, I will learn to control and enjoy my drinking. The persistent illusion is astonishing, just like our book talks about near specific the gates of insanity and death. And I'll guarantee you one thing. I was in the gates of the pure insanity. I got sober almost into my coffin. And I am so grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous as I stand here tonight. I cannot begin to tell you. And you're going to soon see why and stuff. But like I said earlier, my sobriety date is May 30th, 1982. It was not always my sobriety date. When I got my current sponsor, I had to change that date. And there's a reason for that. All these people had to go out and smoke dope when I got sober. And, you know, if you're smoking marijuana in this room now, you are not sober now, Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll tell you right this minute. And I don't want to argue about it afterwards. <laughs> Ask <laughs> I don't want to argue about it afterwards. Ask the old timer if you don't believe me. And if I had to change my date, then by God, so do you. But anyway, I, uh, I, uh, I got my current sponsor, and I tried to explain to him that I'm from in Nebraska. You can have two sobriety dates, one from alcohol and one from drugs. He rather quickly pointed out to me that I was in Southern California. We have one date here to get my date changed. And I was such a smart aleck when I got my current sponsor, and I said, where does the book mention pot? He said, the book does mention pot. And I said, Clancy, I have read that book. When I talk about marijuana in that book, and he said, if I find the word pot in that book, will you change it so I never argue with me again? And I knew I was making a bad deal, you guys, but I did it anyway. And I'll be damned if he didn't flip open the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. On the first page of Bill Wilson's story, it says, died by musket or by pot. I said, that is, that is, that is not what that means. He said, 
Quite frankly, my dear, I don't care what it means. You said the book didn't mention pot. It doesn't mention pot. Change your sobriety date. I know. <laughs> and my life has flourished, i got to tell you guys. But I'm delighted. I love to come to Oregon to speak. And I'm also glad that you don't have a glass phone. You can see your speaker. I had this terrible experience on the East Coast. I was out there giving an AA talk. And oh my talk, my skirt fell off in front of 3,000 people. And they had this glass phone. You could actually see the speaker. And that makes me nervous anyway. And I had this black, not this suit. I, I'll never wear that suit again as long as I live. But <laughs> I had this black suit on this wraparound skirt, and the button came, and I thought, my God, my skirt's going to fall on the floor. And it was too late. It was on the floor. But you guys, you know what? Alcoholic Thomas has taught me to wear underwear, and thank God I had some on. I'll tell you. <laughs> Get some. Also taught me to take action. I just picked up that skirt and kept right on talking. What else are you going to do? <laughs> You guys, this has been, without a doubt, the best two years of my sobriety, my 21st and 22nd year, and I want to share a little bit, a little bit of that with you. You know, if you'd have asked me New Year's Eve, a year ago New Year's Eve, are your men's made in alcoholics synonymous? I would have said yes, and that would have been the absolute truth for me. I'm $86,000 out of debt in this program. I owe nobody no financial, nothing. I'm, I'm home free here. All I could do is go to meetings, have a God in my life, have a sponsor, continue with these steps, and the countless other thousand things we do to stay sober. It looks like I'm going to be fine and stuff. And, you know, our book says that more will be revealed, folks. And I flew to Kansas City, Missouri a year ago on New Year's Eve to give an AA talk. And they had this great big dinner dance party type thing there. So they asked me to come. And, and obviously I flew there. So air traffic control had held us for whatever reason. So we were circling the airport. And I looked out the airplane window and I spied the Hyatt Regency Hotel. I thought, oh, my God, there's the Hyatt Regency. And I remember something I'd done about 35 years ago. You know, I read my inventory to my sponsor. I would not mentioned this for whatever reason. I'd done so much of this sort of thing, it was no big deal, I guess. But now I remember, now i got to tell my sponsor. So I called him up and he said, well, get over there and make amends for you. Probably give the place a bad name. And I thought, well, if I have time, I'll get that done. I did not have time to get that done. That committee kept me really, really busy. And I went back to the airport on New Year's Day and he'd take my flight back to Los Angeles. And, and my flight was canceled. I thought, great, i got five hours to kill here. Go back over the take a shuttle, go back over the high and try to find somebody to talk to. Although I don't think anybody's even going to be here on New Year's Day I can talk to. And boy, I was wrong about that, let me tell you. But anyway, I sat down with the manager of the Hyatt Regency Hotel and I told him what I'd done. 35 years ago, you guys, on Easter morning, I found myself in the Hyatt Regency Hotel glass elevator stark naked. And it landed on the first floor of the hotel. And the door opened up and here was this family standing in their Easter clothes. They're going to have brunch or something. I will never, ever forget the look on these people's faces as long as I live. And so I thought, well, I'll try and talk to somebody. So... I sat down with the manager, and I told him what I'd done. He said, Karen, stop. I have to tell you a funny story. He said, 35 years ago, my dad was manager of the Hyatt Regency at that time, and we were here going to have Easter brunch. And he said, I was <laughs> I was only seven years old. And he said, I'll never forget this ever. And I thought, I bet you won't either. But he said, uh, we have to take the glass elevator upstairs to have the, to the brunch area. And he said, and the door opened up, and a naked woman got off. He said, I'd never seen a naked woman before. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I had to be your first woman. you got to take whatever you can get around here. But anyway, he said, and guess what? Mom and Dad are here this week. And I thought, oh, wonderful. You know. He said, yeah, they're celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary. Let's have them come down and meet you. And I thought, let's not. You know, but we don't say that. We just go along. And I said, whatever you want to do will be fine with me. So Mom and Dad came down. And I thought, my God, they're probably 100 years old on walkers. They'll probably have a heart attack when they find out who I am. But one more time, I was wrong about that. I sound the loveliest people I've ever met before in my life, and they laughed. They said, Karen, we talked about you for years in the bars of the Hyatt Regency. And I thought, yeah, I bet you did too. And I said, I'm so sorry I embarrassed you and your family here those years ago. What can I do to make that right? And they said, just don't ever do it again. I said, you know what? I can't think of anything more disgusting than a 59-year-old woman getting out of a glass elevator stark naked. I doubt very much if I'll be taking that path anytime soon. So as I stand here tonight, my men's are made now clock synonymous. It ain't midnight yet, folks. You never know what's going to happen around here. But anyway, a year ago in May, I was over in Laughlin, Nevada, and I spoke at the Tri-State Roundup over there. If you guys haven't experienced that, get out there next May because it is a fabulous event. They get about six, 7,000 people at this thing. And we were hanging around the casino on Thursday night waiting for the meeting to start, and I hit a $10,000 slot is what happened. And I was to experience every promise in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in five seconds flat. I was to know a new freedom and new happiness and Fear financial insecurity left me temporarily, and if you're new here tonight, that is not how you get the promises in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I swear to God, I got them on. It was really a great experience. Don Laughlin doing the Riverside Hotel there. You know, when you hit money like that, you're going to get management's attention real quick. They want their money back is what they want, but he came downstairs, and he said, can we extend your stay? And I said, no, check, please. It's going back to L.A., and he said, what are you doing here this week? And I said, 
last time I was speaking at the convention, he said, oh, can I come and hear you speak? I love to hear the A speakers. And I thought, why would you want to do that? And he, and he said, oh, I just love to hear them. And I said, well, it's your hotel. Do whatever you want to, I guess. And, and by God, he was in line the very next night. They never give up, folks. Trust me. You know what he said to me? Are you sure we can't extend your stay? <laughs> I said, I'm absolutely positive. But I'm happy to report here tonight. I bought that 10 grand back to Los Angeles. I paid my car off with it. And one more time, I am debt-free in Alcox Thomas, and it is a great position to be in, let me tell you guys. I never wish to go back to where I came from. It took me 18 years to get out of debt in Alcox Thomas. It's like paying for dead horses everywhere. But by God, I paid all that money back, and I'm so glad I did. And I am not a martyr. Trust me, I didn't want to pay one penny of the back. You know the truth. And my sponsor told me, then get a different sponsor. I don't work with people that file bankruptcy. Some people have to do that. You don't have to do it. Figure out a way to do it. I thought, well, there's no arguing with him. i got to pay the money back. So, But you know what? Once I started doing that, I really started feeling good about myself, you guys. And, you know, I'm standing here 22 years sober tonight. I have no debts. And, you know, I found that after all those years of paying that money back, I really don't need much. Do you want to know the truth? I never want to go back to debt again. I hated being in debt. But anyway, it's been a great two years of my sobriety, let me tell you guys. And, you know, I, I come from a wonderful home there in Nebraska, and I want you to know that. And my mother wants you to know it, too, I'll guarantee you. You know, my mom died 13 years ago, and God, I miss her so much, I can't begin to tell you guys. And Boy, you only get one, folks, and when they're gone, they're gone. And I've made amends to her many, many years ago with a wonderful relationship the last few years of her life and stuff, but I just miss her so much. And, you know, I'm back to Nebraska in August to see my family and my grandkids and stuff, and, and I told my eldest son, I'm going to go out to Grandmother Warner's grave and put some flowers down. I said, where's your other mother, your grandmother buried? I wasn't there for my ex-mother-in-law's funeral. I have no idea where she was buried. And he, and he told me, he said, just go to Grandma Warner's grave and put down the flowers then mark off 15 rows, and you'll be at Grandma Lynn's grave. And I said, okay, it's a tiny little graveyard. And it was overcast in Nebraska, and it had been raining and stuff, and it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I had to speak in the evening at 5.30. I told him I'd come to that, and, and so I was really in kind of a hurry and stuff. But I put the flowers down, I marked off 15 rows, and I did not see that open grave there, you guys. I didn't see any open grave there. And I set the flowers down on my ex-mother-in-law's grave, and I stepped back, and I found myself in an 8-foot grave. You know, and I couldn't get out of there, you know. Once you're in there, you're in there, trust me. But anyway, the grave, the grave diggers uh, in Nebraska, before the day before the funeral, they opened the grave up, and then they, they put a tarp up and a, and a caution sign, the thing to hold the casket. It was basically impossible to fall on the grave. But they didn't do that. They went to dinner because nobody was there, and they were going to come back and do it later, and here I wander along. But anyway, I thought, how am I going to get, there was nobody there but me, and I thought, i got to speak at this A meeting for 20 minutes. I'm standing with mud on my dress. You know, how am I going to get out of here and stuff? And what do you do? You start screaming, help is what you do. So pretty soon this old lady walked over the grave, and she's old, but I'm not, right? And she walked over the grave, and, and she said, I don't think you're supposed to be in there. And I thought, thank you for sharing, ma'am. But anyway, I said, do you have a cell phone on you? And she says, you know, I don't. And I I said, well, you go up to the office and tell them I'm in this grave to call the fire department or somebody to get me out of here. And she said, okay. And I said, tell them not to run the sirens. Nobody's hurt here. And so here they come, you guys, six Lincoln, Nebraska fire trucks with their sirens going, three police cars with their sirens going, and reporters of all damn things. <laughs> they are so bored in Lincoln, Nebraska, they have to report all fire calls. And I said, don't you dare put my name in the paper. And they said, oh, we'd never do that. We had to report the incident. I said, I don't care about that. Don't put my name in the paper. Monday morning, Lincoln General and Star, California woman falls an eight-foot grade, Karen Garrison. I thought, oh, that makes me so mad. I got about a hundred phone calls on that one, let me tell you. But anyway, you never know what's going to happen now, Fox Thomas. But anyway, I come, I come from an, I come from an alcoholic home, and I don't think that's neither here nor there. I don't do well with people that stand AA podiums and blame anybody for anything. And my father died from this disease on the streets of Chicago in 1979. And you tell me how a major in the Air Force dies on Skid Row. I don't know how that happened. And the fact that he was an alcoholic. And whether he found A or not, I do not know. I just know that he certainly did not stay sober as a result of it. So one more time tonight, this is a cunning, baffling, powerful disease that kills people. This is not a game I'm playing up here. This is serious business. And I would give any the world if my father were alive tonight, because we would have a lot to talk about, I can tell you. I have a sister who was Miss Wara in high school and homecoming queen and cheerleading and all that kind of stuff and made straight A's and never cracked a book. And I made straight F's and never cracked a book. And that was the difference. My sister was a beautiful little girl. She's a gorgeous woman today. She looks nothing like I do, i got to tell you. She was a model for many, many years for Neiman Marcus in Dallas, and now she's retired and teaches school in the West Indies. And i got to tell you guys, as a direct result of this program, I love my sister very, very much tonight. I found out something about her. She's also very beautiful on the inside, too, and I never used to know that. I have a brother who was a fighter pilot in the Navy for many, many years. My brother retired two years ago in August, and 
you know, 9-11 and Iraq and so forth. He's been called back in the service. And, you know, my brother is really old to be a fighter pilot, you guys. He's 51 years old. And we were growing up. I thought he was such a dork, I can't begin to tell you. Straight as an arrow, Mike. Doesn't drink. Doesn't use drugs. Doesn't screw around. He was an embarrassment to me, if you want to know the truth. And, and, uh, and tonight, I'm so proud of that man, I cannot begin to tell you. He wouldn't catch me over Iraq in any fighter plane. But neither one of these people are alcoholic. And I have another sister who's married the public defender in Lincoln, Nebraska, who got me out of a whole bunch of trouble when I got sober. And I'm welcome in their homes, Dana. I never used to be. I come from basically a very boring family, to know the truth. They're high successful people, and they bore me to tears. I love them, but they bore me to tears. And I have a couple kids who are 44 and 45 years old, and I know I certainly don't look old enough to have kids at age, but by God, I sure do. And, and this is where it really starts getting interesting to me. These kids are anything but boring, i got to tell you guys. As a matter of fact, they're a couple of jerks, if you want to know the truth. But you know what? Those couple of jerks are giving me five of the most gorgeous grandbabies you have ever seen before in your life. And, you know, I hate to be a bragging grandmother, so I stand and I test people to do this, but when I did, it's a whole different ball game. let me tell you. I have a, a beautiful grandson. His name is Ryan, and Ryan is 15, soon to be 16 years old. And apparently, Ryan, little Ryan is quite a gymnast, you guys. I knew he was good. I didn't know he was that good. And my son and his wife got a phone call from Budweiser to St. Louis, Missouri, wanted to sponsor this kid and train him for the Olympics, you guys. And, and my son called me, and this is the kind of alcoholic I am. I jump from phone call to Olympic Stadium, gold medal around his neck, and what will I wear, you know? It happened just that quick, but I found myself telling my son, Jeff, you have to do what you think is right. This is your child, not mine. I wanted to shriek at him and say, let him go. You, It's the opportunity of a lifetime, but I kept my mouth shut. Once my alcoholic Thomas has taught me to keep my mouth shut, and it really turned out well this time. He said, Mom, we don't know what to do. He's so little to be going away. What would you do, Mom? Now I'm on, folks. And, and I said, well... Jeff, I don't think anybody knows what they would do for sure unless it happens to him. But I said, we have a dear friend, Lincoln, who's a child psychologist. And I said, why don't you have Chris come over and talk to Ryan and see what he thinks? And, and my son did exactly that. And you know that child psychologist told my son and his wife, let him go. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. He's a very stable young man. So I'm happy to report here tonight that my little grandson is down in Norman, Oklahoma, trained at Nadia Komeni, she and Bart Connors Clinic down there. And you guys, I have no idea what's going to happen. But I have no idea. But I'll guarantee you one thing. The next Summer Olympics, if that baby goes, his ground will be there. If I have to walk there, I'll be there. But, you know, in our book, Alcoholic Psalmist, it says that great events will come to pass for us and countless others. And I want to share a very good event in my life with you. It won't be in your lives, but most certainly in mine. You guys, when I got sober, my family wanted absolutely nothing to do with me. They had all the crap they were going to take off me years before I quit drinking. I had to walk away from their own sanity of the truth. So, then I get from my family is icing on the cake, let me tell you guys. And, and through making amends around here and sponsorship and the things we do, it's all turned around for me now. But it took a long time for it to happen. In my case, that's a good thing. But on my 20th day birthday, I got a phone call about 1030 at night. And it was Ryan. It was his very first day down in Norman, Oklahoma. And he called me and he said, oh, grandmother, I'm so sorry to call you so late. And I said, it is never too late to call your grandmother. Don't you ever think that. And he said, oh, grandma, I wanted to wish you a happy 20th day birthday. And you guys, I just stood there and cried like a baby. And he said, oh, Grandma, I didn't make you cry. And I said, you didn't make me cry. I'm crying because I'm so happy that you called me. And he said, oh, Grandma, we're so proud of you. And I thought, oh, stop, you know. But anyway, I wouldn't trade that phone call for that 10,000. Well, that's not quite true, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and the same thing happened on A, birth number 21, A, birth number 22. And I will tell you what a precious thing in my life that is, you guys. If you're new here tonight and your family wants nothing to do with you, do what your sponsor asks you to do. Just take some actions to do what the sponsor wants you to do. But I'll tell you, it took me a lot of cards, a lot of phone calls, a lot of a lot of stuff to make my family think any different. They had to see me sober for a long, long time before they knew I was sober. But I'm just trying to give you some hope here. There is hope. But anyway, I was a disruptive jerk when I was growing up, always in trouble. I used to go to classrooms. I hated discipline. I was very, very rebellious. I really hated people telling me what to do, and I like it even less today, if you want to the truth. And, you know, I never felt like I belonged anywhere. I hear that a lot from AA podiums, and I'm right on with that 125 percent, i got to tell you. You know, I really don't remember my first drink, you guys, but I can tell you that I hope to God I never forget my last one. And I hope it was my last one. And what alcohol did for me from the very beginning? It made me feel like I belonged. I could do anything I wanted to be. I could do anything I wanted to do. I drank at any given opportunity after that, and I was probably about 13 years old. You know, I realize that I'm in need of Alcoholics Anonymous tonight, and I honor this podium by talking about alcoholism up here. I used a lot of drugs, too. They've got a small part of my story. My sponsor encourages me to do that. You know, when I was growing up in Nebraska, there just was not a lot of drugs on the street. But I'll guarantee you, I found every single one of those drugs. And, you know, there was some marijuana and speed and stuff. And today, if you caught the possession of marijuana, you get a ticket. Big deal. When I was growing up, you went to prison is what happened to you. 
And that didn't scare me, absolutely nothing scared me. I think I wasn't supposed to be doing it. I'm one of these alcoholic females, and I hate to say this from an AA podium, but it's precisely the way that it was for me. And we're supposed to tell the truth up here, that if you pat me on the head, my pants fall off is what happens to me. And I, I got myself into a lot of trouble when I was growing up. I absolutely love men. I absolutely love men. I love everything about them. You know about and I love about them. They've been the downfall of my entire existence, and they remain the same today, I'm sorry to say. And I, I particularly like sick men. There's a room for them here tonight. I can just feel it. And so, one thing, girls, I love about Southern California, where I live, it's got so many sick men, I'm just entertained around the clock 24 hours a day. And, you know, you guys, I'm 60 years old, and I have a boyfriend. You very well believe I have a boyfriend. He lives in New York, and I live in L.A. That's why we get along so well and stuff. But, so things haven't changed a whole lot for me in that arena. But anyway, I can tell you guys a funny story. I was in Nashville, Tennessee about maybe 13 years ago giving a talk, and one of the fine ladies of Nashville, Tennessee, A, walked up to me afterwards, I want to know, and this woman said to me, she said, you're disgusting. And she wasn't kidding, you guys. She meant every word of it. And I said, Lady, from where I come from, being disgusting is a step up, I can assure you. And, and uh, <laughs> Furthermore, if I wanted you to sponsor me, I'd flown to Nashville and asked you. You know, I hear, some women, I hear some women get this podium, and I wonder if they ever drank, you guys. I really do. They're all their drinking women said, shoot it to them through the keyhole with an eyedropper. I was out there big time. I got myself into a lot of trouble. I've been taught to share that feeling of alcohol, alcohol Anonymous. And if I if anybody in this room tonight, I would never offend anybody in the program that saved my life. And besides that, my book tells me, and this is my favorite part of our book, it says, cling to the thought that in God's hands your dark past will be the greatest possession that you have. And it goes on to say, because you can literally avert death and misery for others. And I found it to be very, very true in my sobriety. So if I offend anybody here, and I want to hear about it afterwards. But anyway, I got pregnant when I was 16 years old, and I had to get married. In my day, girls, you had to get married. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about that. just what we did and stuff. And as it must be, I married an alcoholic. He was 17, I was 16, I couldn't cook, I couldn't clean, I couldn't take care of a baby, nor did I want to take care of a baby. And before we knew, we had two babies to take care of, and I quick found out what caused all that, and I put a halt to it, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> and that caused me a lot of trouble throughout the years. And as it must be, I married an individual that refused to work, that drank on a daily basis, just a moment, beat me up on a daily basis, and I had never seen a man hit a woman before in my life, you guys. I'll guarantee you one thing. If my dad would lay one hand on my mom, she'd have knocked him from here to the moon, i got to tell you. And I grew to hate this guy very, very much, and I'm not blaming him for my disease, so please don't get me wrong. It's just part of my story, and I need to share it. And, and some in that family had to get a job, and I didn't finish junior high yet, for Christ's sakes. And I found a job as a nurse at the hospital there in Lincoln, and the magic was put in my life. I literally fell in love with nursing, and I made a plan to myself. I would love to go to school, and I'd love to become a registered nurse. That's what I'd love to do. You know, they say that alcoholics don't have willpower. And I'm here to tell you now from this podium that that is a bunch of garbage. I have more willpower than 20 elephants. I don't have one ounce of willpower when it comes to my disease. But when I want to do something, I'm going to do it. And I went back. I finished junior high. I finished high school. I went to college full-time for three years, and I worked full-time for three years. And I'm talking about 18, 20 hours a day, you guys, and that is hard stuff to do. I do not drink. I used to do drugs during this period of time. At age of 27 years old, I became a registered nurse. And if you think I'm proud to stand here tonight and tell you that I got jerked in front of the State Board of Nursing in Nebraska, and they told me, you are a disgrace to your profession, you're a disgrace to nursing, you're a disgrace to medicine, you are no longer working because we just jerked your nursing license. If you think I'm proud of that, you are sadly wrong. You guys, I love my profession. I really, really mean that. And I would never do anything to jeopardize the people I take care of, nor the people I work with in ordinary circumstances. And what I have to tell you now is a story about how I threw it right down the toilet so I could drink. And that is total insanity. It's also called alcoholism. At the age of 27 years old, I divorced this man. And girls, i got to tell you that a whole new world opened up to me. It's called men and alcohol. And I went absolutely hog wild is what I did. I was engaged eight times during that divorce. I never did, never did marry these people. Two of them died from alcoholism. I know nothing about social drinking. I drank and with alcoholics and we do indeed die from this. And at the age of 27 years old, I went to work in surgery at the hospital there in Lincoln, and I had that job for 19 years. I love working in the operating room. I love taking care of those patients. It's a colorful, exciting nursing position. I drank. I was medical people mostly. They were colorful, intense people. They worked hard, and they played hard. And I need to tell you guys that the incidence of alcoholism amongst my profession is tremendously high, and that would do a lot for you. So you're going to have surgery next week. That has to be very, very true. And, and those people are so grateful that I'm sober that they can't see straight. And I'm talking about alcoholics is what I'm talking about. You know, in our book, Alcoholic Psalmist, it says clearly that we're to tell in a general way what our drinking is like. And you get the general idea real quick about what my drinking is like. 
I can tell you guys about my drinking about five seconds flat, you know the truth. Many, many years ago, I was at a little concert in upstate New York called Woodstock. And I'm not talking about that piece of crap they had nine years ago. I'm talking about the real Woodstock. Yeah. And there will never be another one, trust me on that. The kids from the 60s threw a party that nobody will ever match, I'm quite sure. And you know why there'll never be another one? That wasn't supposed to happen to begin with. But New York got when they're going to have this big event. And they told these people, if you don't get medical coverage, you are not going to have this concert. They started hiring people from Lincoln. They thought people were responsible. And we were a seedy lot, I can assure you. And I was the first drunk to sign up for this thing. And got nine girls I worked with to join me. And met all these doctors from New York. And there we were at Woodstock. I never seen so much alcohol in place in my entire life. You could have floated a vaginal problem whatsoever. And the drugs, it was like a candy store. And everybody was sharing, we were sharing narcotics on everybody else. And we had this great big semi-truck on that back lot of Woodstock. That was our hospital park back there. And I don't recall being in that semi the entire week. But I do recall what it was like to stand in front of the stage at night that Richie Haven sang Freedom and Joe Cocker and Country Joe sent on those groups that I love. I come from the roaring 60s, you guys, and I love rock and roll, let me tell you. And things have not changed in my life one little tiny bit. I loved Elvis Presley and Janis Joplin was my lady, let me tell you. Wouldn't Janis Joplin have been a fine member of Alcoholic Psalmist, you guys? I'd have hung out with Janis, let me tell you. I'd have traded Janice for Clancy any day of the week if you want to the truth. <laughs> that is a big fat lie. Do not tell him I said that. I was just kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't trade my sponsor for 20 Janice Joplin's, but drinking for me at one time was a fun thing, you guys. It'd be a lie from Santa and anything but that. But I cannot remember the fun after the pain that it caused me. And one more time, I am so grateful, Alcohol Thomas, I cannot begin to tell you and stuff. And, you know, the drunk driving charges, the bad checks, all the stuff that we eventually do. My kids were in trouble. I never could marry these guys I was engaged to. They kept dying from alcoholism. And I thought, you know, I need to get married to my ex-husband again. That's what I need to do. The kids need their father. Besides, I get even with him for all the things he's done to me. And those are not very good reasons to get married again, i got to tell you. And I'm certainly not proud of this. I stand here tonight. You know, if anybody in this room is thinking about getting married to the same person twice, don't do it. You're going to be sorry. The only way I can describe it is like taking a bite out of the same turd twice. Sorry, but that's the way I feel. I know. Can I dance that man? <laughs> he feels the same way I do, as a matter of fact. But I danced that man through three of the most miserable years of his life on the face of this earth. And, and I love to tell you guys the stormberry to tell you. And my sponsor always tells me that is not funny. And you should not be telling that from the AA podium. I said, okay, fine, then I won't tell him. He said, no, go ahead and tell those people see how sick you really were. And apparently how sick you really still are. And, I'm still sick, and I still think it's funny, and I'm telling the story. <laughs> when I married him again, I told him, I said, if you ever hit me again, buddy, I will kill you next time you hit me. And he said, I'll never hit you again ever. And I said, you better see that you don't. And he lied is what he did. And he came home drunk one night, and, and I happened to be sober this night for some reason, and I'll never know why, because I usually wasn't. And girls, you know what guys do when they come home drunk. They want to take you to bed and stuff, and I was not buying it. If there's anything I can't stand, it's some drunk man mauling me when I'm sober. You know. <laughs> Really? You know. And I told him, I said, <laughs> anyway, he came home and indicated that to me, and I said, you get your hands off me and leave me alone. I wanted nothing to do with him, period. And he broke my arm is what he did. And I'm here to tell you guys that I was pissed. As a matter of fact, I'm still pissed about it, if you want the truth. And I told him, I said, you go to sleep on that couch, and so help me God, when you wake up, you're going to wish you'd never been born. He said it for hours, you guys, with his eyes pried open. And as it must be, he finally passed out. And I started drinking martinis. And this is a classic example of what alcohol did for me. Alcohol told me what to do. I didn't tell it what to do. And I had about eight, ten martinis, and I was spilling no pain, I can assure you. And I was sitting there watching this guy. And I hate to tell you what this man was doing, but I can't tell you the story unless I can tell you what he was doing. He was laying on the couch playing with himself. I thought, you disgusting man, you made me sick to my stomach. And the more I drank, the matter I got. And you guys, you know, I'm a nurse, and I'm very familiar with male anatomy. And I'd be very familiar with male anatomy if I wasn't a nurse. But <laughs> I thought to myself, what can I do to get even this guy for all the things he's done to me? And I came up with this brilliant idea in my drunken stupor. That's one thing we should never do, folks, is drink and think at the same time. And this is many, many years ago, you guys, when super glue first came out. And super glue was powerful stuff. You know, Mrs. Bobbitt has nothing on me, I can assure you. I was a form for she ever got started. And I got that super glue out, and I read the directions on that super glue. And like I said, I was drunk, and I wasn't seeing very clearly. And what I thought those directions said were, if this hits human skin, you better get it off in 15 hours. Now, why would it say something stupid like that? 
what it said was, in fact, that this is human skin. You better get it off in five minutes is what it said. And I wanted this guy, I get so excited when I tell this story, I could just do it all over again. Right. Right. I went over this guy, and I poured super glue all over this guy's groin, and I mean everywhere. There was not one place, man, I have super glue, and I laughed about it, and I went to bed. And, uh, and I woke up in the morning to screams of horror, like you cannot even believe it. You know, I did not mean to hurt this guy as bad as I did. I swear to God that's true, but I'll tell you what happened to my ex-husband. This guy never had the advantage of being circumcised when he was born, and now he clearly was, I can assure you. And, uh, we had a telephone by our bed there in our bedroom there in Lincoln. He called the police and the cops were in front of our home with their sirens going. There was an ambulance out there. The neighbors were gawking out their windows. And, you know, one thing you guys got to keep in mind here, they do not see things like this happen in Lincoln, Nebraska. In California, it would not surprise me one bit, but certainly not there. And the cops were laughing, which led me the whole thing was funny. And they said, lady, are you crazy or what? Why would you do something like this? I said, what makes you think that I did it anyway? I was only standing there with glue on my hands. And they said, you're under arrest for assault and battery. And I said, you cannot arrest wives in Nebraska for assault and battery against their husbands. I knew better than that. And two days later when I got out of jail, I guess I didn't know better than that. And they took that man to the very hospital that I worked at in surgery, and he had to have surgery. And one more time, the whole staff saw what Karen did, and they took me to jail. I might add, it turned out to be a terrible, terrible thing. Those doctors down in Lincoln couldn't get that glue off, and they had to get these surgeons down from Creighton University Medical School in Omaha, Nebraska to get that glue off. And you know, there's a paper in about that at Creighton, and even in this room, thinking about going to medical school, you can read about it if you want to. I'd always wanted a paper in about me, but not like this, i got to tell you. And, and I was sitting in that jail thinking to myself, I am getting out of this marriage. When this guy comes home from the hospital, he's going to glue something to mine shut. He would have, too, i got to tell you. <laughs> Sorry, but he would have. And for those of you who don't know this, that happened to a lady in Kentucky about three years ago. It was on the national news, and I was on the freeway. But I had a wreck when I heard it. I thought, my God, better her than me, i got to tell you. But... You know, like I said earlier, we have an immense step in this program, and my sponsor me to get on an airplane and fly to Sacramento, California, and they convinced my ex-husband where he currently lives. And I tried to tell my sponsor, I'm not sorry that I did that. Therefore, I don't have to make the amends. He said, I don't care whether you're sorry or not. Get in the airplane, get there, and do what I'm asking you to do, and maybe one of these days you will be sorry. I don't tell anybody in this room tonight, and that guy sees me, he kind of backs up, let me tell you. But we are able to sit down and talk and stuff, and I made my amends to him. And I will tell you guys, I walked away from that man. I was free what I had done to him. I was free of being married to him twice. And I will tell you, for the first time in my sobriety, the promise of the biblical alcoholic psalmist came true in my life. And you would also found about that? Motives mean nothing here, folks. My motives sucked on that one, let me tell you. But I still got the promises, so go figure. It's actually an alcoholic psalmist that counts, not motives around here and stuff. But, but anyway, i got to tell you guys a funny story. <laughs> I, went up to, I went up to Lompoc Prison to speak about maybe a year and a half ago. As we all know, it's a men's fellow penitentiary in Central Coast, California. They're this monthly speakers meeting, so they invite folks to drive up there and share and so forth. So I went up there, and you have to go to the guard, carrying you push the button. They say, who are you, and what is your business? And I told them, they said, well, Mrs. Garrison, do you have any weapons on you, any guns, knives, explosives? And I said, no. And they said, well, Mrs. Garrison, do you have any super glue on you? <laughs> For the first time in my life, I was totally speechless, you know. <laughs> it was so funny. The guard, they're from the guard tower laughing. The prisoners put them up here and stuff, and I said, well, no, as a matter of fact, I don't. They said, well, then you can come on in. And then the prisoners took me to their meeting room, and they had this black one. There was a great big circle with a red slash. And said, no super glue in here tonight. You never know what's going to happen. I like Thomas. But anyway, I divorced this guy one more time, and, and I got involved in the most bizarre man I've ever met before in my life. This guy told me he was in the mafia. Now, I don't think anybody in Nebraska is in the mafia, for Christ's sake. So I was lying to him, and he was lying to me. It was your typical alcoholic nightmare is what it was. I was drinking on a daily basis. I was starting to have severe tremors from all this drinking I was doing. It was beginning to be no more fun, i got to tell you guys. You know, I'm a nurse, and I've studied alcoholism. I knew all about it before I became one. It shows me one more time tonight what our book says is so true. Self-knowledge avails us nothing to this disease. It's action that counts. Nowhere in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous do we have a chapter called Into Thinking. We do have an into action. <laughs> and that's the only reason I'm standing here 22 years sober. And the day came to me the hospital told me, Karen, you are the finest nurse on this staff. You have won awards for your nursing ability. What is wrong with you? You have a drinking problem. You cannot read about you in the paper anymore. Drunk driving charges, bad chicks, blue and husband. Everything you do in Nebraska is in the paper, I'm sorry to say. And they knew my game. And they said, you're either going to a treatment center or you're out of here. But you guys, you know what? You don't tell people like me that stuff. And I said, you and what army is going to make me go to a treatment center? And I walked out of a job that I love more than even the whole world. And I cannot say that enough tonight. And I drank and I drank and I died and I died a thousand times over. 
I went to work at a nursing home there in Lincoln, and what I'm ready to share with you guys is something I am not proud to discuss in the AA podium. It took me years to my sobriety before I would ever mention this. I found myself still in drugs in that nursing home, and it has nothing to do with me liking drugs. I was physically addicted to alcohol by now. I had to have this stuff. I couldn't go more than three hours without drinking. I had terrible withdrawal symptoms. I couldn't drink at work, so I started stealing narcotics. It was just that damn simple. And I hated myself so bad I cannot begin to tell you. And the day came to me, the people that ran that place came up to me, and they said, Karen, what is wrong with you? You are just weird as what you are. And they said, good care of the patient. You're a great nurse, but you're just strange. And I remember thinking to myself, you'd be strange, too, if you had 200 milligrams of Dimerol on board. You'd be strange, too. And I threw my keys at them, and I walked out the door before they fired me. I went to work at Bryan Memorial Hospital there in Lincoln. And you guys, it's a fine, fine facility. And I was drunk on that end of that nursing position. And I'm not talking about falling down drunk. I was just maintaining a certain level of alcohol in my bloodstream that I wouldn't have shaken had those violent tremors. That is clearly desperation drinking. Our book describes it vividly. And I was in hot water up to my union, let me tell you. The very thought that I might drink again makes the hair on my neck stand straight up. And that's why I'm an active, active member of Alcoholics Anonymous and stuff. And, and the day came to me when I got caught red hands stone some morphine in the hospital. This has got to be, without a doubt, the most humiliating day of my entire life. And they said, you give us your narcotic keys and you get out of this hospital. And she will walk back in here again. We're reporting this to the State Board of Nursing Nebraska. That's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they should have done. My other two jobs should have done, too, as a matter of fact. And long story short here tonight, I lost my nursing license. And to make a long story short and me tonight, I wound up on the streets of Nebraska is what happened to me. And you guys, I spent two years on the streets. And I've told the Midwest I prostituted myself, and I'll guarantee you one thing, that I have seen and done things that no woman should ever see her doing. I'm still so sick in the head sometimes I think to myself, I wouldn't mind seeing some of them again. You know, and my sponsor assures me I am still a very ill person if you think of that kind of crap. And, you know, I've been in nut houses, I've been in detoxes, I've been in jails, I've been in institutions. I cannot think of a thing down the streets of the grass and an alcoholic. Things happen to me I would not repeat in this podium tonight, but I'm sure that you have the general idea. And two years went by for me, and there I was back there in Lincoln, standing on skid row, sucking on a bottle of Mad Dog. And I certainly have better things in terms of myself than to be doing that, i got to tell you. I will never forget that last day of my drinking as long as I live. And I hope to God it was the last day of my drinking. I apparently was so physically sick I just passed down the streets is what happened to me. But before that happened, I remember thinking to myself, there was a Hilton Hotel adjacent to that Skid Row area. And I remember thinking two years ago, I used to stand on top of the Hilton Hotel and drink martinis with surgeons. What am I doing standing on Skid Row drinking with these people? And I rather imagine those folks felt the same way when they arrived there. And like I said, I can't tell you much about it at all. I woke up in an intensive care ward, the very hospital I was born at, the very hospital that I worked at for 19 years, and I will tell you guys clearly that the alcoholic hell for me started the day I got sober. You know, I'm not a very big person. I weighed 95 pounds when I got sober, and I was coming off a quarter whatever day and 200 milligrams of value in the day. That is a lot of booze. That's a lot of pills, and I had a lot of dimes, let me tell you. You know, they say that most alcohol withdrawal is over within three days, and perhaps it is for some people. It certainly was not for me. It was going to be a long, long time for us to start feeling better. And I laid in that intensive care ward. I had tubes come out of my belly. They were draining fluid off my liver. I had IVs going. And I found myself in withdrawal that was so bad I cannot begin to tell you guys. And I laid in that intensive care ward, and I shook, and I shook, and I died, and I died for 30 solid days. And I screamed at those nurses and demanded they give me drugs for this withdrawal. And they said, you're not getting nothing from us. If you gave me anything, it would probably kill you. You're not getting nothing from us. Your heart's not feeling any irregularities. So quit asking for them. And let me tell you what these people did to me. And let me, I will be forever grateful as long as I'm sober in this program. They got 10 members of Alcoholics Thomas to come and sit with me. And these people never left me day or night for 30 solid days. And, you know, I just want to say something very quickly here because I feel so strongly about this because it saved my life. Once on A, I hear people say, not very many people, I don't hear that often, but when I hear it, I want to throttle them by the neck. They say things like, we don't go unless the alcoholic calls us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing here 22 years sober tonight. I never made any damn phone call. Where'd that crap come from? If it's good enough for our co-founders, by God, it's good enough for us. I think Bill called Bob as the story goes. I don't think Bob calls Bill. And you know what? My responsibility statement does indeed say, when anyone anywhere reaches out for help, you want the hand of aid always to be there. And for that, I'm responsible. The nurses reached out, the alcoholics responded, and I have to believe as a direct result of that, I'm standing here 22 years sober tonight. But anyway, I just love these people. And they say things like, Karen, just keep breathing. That's all I got to do is breathe. And I say, when is this withdrawal going to stop? And they said, when it's time, that's what's going to stop. And that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted a date is what I wanted. And they were absolutely accurate about that. When it's time, it's time. And at 30 days of sobriety, I walked that official treatment from that hospital. I'm a product of a treatment center. I have no opinion on one way or the other. But apparently I went to a fine one because all they talked about was alcoholics anonymous. And boy, there's a lot of bad ones out there, you guys. Let me tell you. And thank God I went to a good one. And let me tell you what I was like when I was 30 days sober. I turned on you like you could not even believe when you started telling me what to do. 
and she's so desperately on day one that 30 days later was a whole different ball game. And you know, where I went through treatment, a lot of people got kicked out of treatment for fraternizing. I didn't. Nobody wants to fraternize with an orange person, I can assure you. And, and <laughs> they used to bring the, bring the patients over the hospital and they'd say, look at her, see what's going to happen to you if you keep on drinking? Look at her. But, how dare you bring people in my room and say stuff like that? But you guys, you know what? Retrospect tonight, I am really glad they did that. I get to think about that before I pick up any drink. But I was on a quick study in the inpatient 30-day program. You know my rotten behavior. I was in there for seven long months. That's a long time to be in an inpatient 30-day program. But I completed that inpatient program. And I went to an outpatient program. And I went to an evening care program. And I went to an aftercare program. And I found myself a very, very active member of Alcoholics Anonymous in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I wasn't doing one thing to really teach people on AA to do it. And I rapidly went through 19 sponsors in that town. I would tell the new people, you don't need to read the book, and you don't need a sponsor. We can really want to do around here. This is an individual program. And needless to say, I was not real popular with the old-timers in Lincoln, Nebraska. You guys, the old-timers, they are so precious to me as I stand here tonight, but not in 1982. I could kill us when these people thought. And you can pull your stuff around here just for so long, and these old-timers are going to start nailing you one right after the other. God love the old-timers and Alcoholics Thomas. They at least saved my life. And, boy, they are dying off right and left, i got to tell you guys. And they have taught me well. And I'll be internally grateful, but this old guy with 29 years of sobriety, he doesn't have an A in one day. He said, come outside, I want to talk to you. He said, you stay away from new people. How dare you tell the new people in AA, they read the book and they need a sponsor. He said, you're like a typhoid Mary in AA. Everybody dies around you, but you're able to stay sober somehow. He said, you stay away from new people. And he went on to tell me, there's going to be a man from California speaking in Carney, Nebraska this weekend. His name is Clancy. You're going to go up to this man, speak to him, ask this man if he will sponsor you. He is a master at dealing with jerks like you. And I heard all... I hear all about Clancy, and I want nothing to do with him, period, because I knew I was going to be in bad, bad trouble. And i got to tell you guys that my fears have been justified 8,000 times over. I told this old timer, I said, who do you think you are that you're going to tell me to be my sponsor now, Clark Thomas? He said, if you don't get in that car and go with us Saturday, I'm going to tell everybody Lincoln how you stole money from an AA meeting. And I'll guarantee I was in that car going to Carney, Nebraska. And, and, I, and I paid that money back, too, by the way. I did pay it back. I did. And I will tell you guys from a podium in Connie, Nebraska, that Clancy literally put the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous in my life. My life has never been the same since that talk. And there's a reason for that. For the first time in my sobriety, I was identifying another alcoholic. And as I understand Alcoholics Anonymous, that's what this thing is all about. I know of no finer speaker in the world than my sponsor. I'm not saying that you need to believe that. It's only important that I believe that. And by the end of that talk, I wanted that man for my sponsor. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how God looks in my life. I wouldn't have asked that man to sponsor me in a million years. Trust me when I've asked him. And I found myself walk across that convention floor and asked that man to be my sponsor. And he looked at me and he said, I don't sponsor crazy people like you. And that's a lie anyway. He sponsors people crazy I never thought of being. And I thought to myself, what did he say that to me for? He doesn't even know me. And I was standing in my little white dress on, my little white gloves on, acting like an angel. And I wasn't aware of the fact this old timer had called him to his party from coming to Nebraska and asked if they brought me if he would talk to me. He said, of course I will. He knew my game when he came. He said, Karen, I like to sponsor people on long-distance basis, but I'm going to do this for you. If I don't do it for you, you probably go die somewhere. He said, I'm going to tell you something, little girl, and you better listen to me real good because I'm going to say it one time and one time only. You're going to call me every day. I tell you not to call me every day. You're going to read that book. You're going to sponsor people. You're going to become an active bomber of Alcoholics Anonymous. You're not going to argue with me. you send your actions to me. You're going to do what I ask you to do. And if you don't want to do that, then get yourself a different sponsor. And you guys, you want to talk about we stood at the turning point. This is the day when my recovery really began in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I said two words that I almost fell over when I said them. I said, yes, sir. I don't tell people, yes, sir. Trust me, I do not. And one more time, God do it for me. I can't do it for myself. This has got to start for me somewhere. Might as well start my sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went back to Lincoln. I became very, very active in the right way. I I sponsored a lot of women in that town. I am not bragging about that. It's not that much fun to sponsor 56 crazy women in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I grew to love those women very, very much, and I'll tell you why. It literally showed me the first four years of my sobriety what to do and what not to do in this program. And every one of those women is still sober today, with the exception of one, and she died in a car accident when she was 13 years sober. But she died sober, you guys, and it wasn't because of me. They were active, active members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the first directions my sponsor gave me, I want you to get that nursing license back. I tried to tell this man, I cannot get that kind of humiliation. He said, Karen, are you arguing with me? And I said, no. He said, get the State Board of Nursing in Nebraska. Tell those people you've been sober in A for a year and a half. you got the option to get your nursing license back. And you guys, I knew it wasn't going to work, but I did it anyway. And that's without a doubt the most important thing I can say in this room tonight. I did what my sponsor asked me to do, whether I thought it would work or not. And I asked them for my license back. And they looked at me like I had just grown horns on the top of my head, I can assure you. And they said, how many links are you willing to go to? And 
I had to do a lot, you guys. I had to take crap off people for two years that I wouldn't hire to mow my own lawn, if you know the truth. And I had to keep my mouth shut in the process, too. And one of the happiest days of my life occurred 18 years ago last April. When one more time I was here in front of the State Board of University of Nebraska, and what they told me brought me to my knees for the first time in Alcoholics Anonymous. They said, welcome home. You're fully being saved as a registered nurse. And as a gift from AA, I don't deserve it. By God, I intend to take it. I came here to visit a couple times. I fell in love with Southern California, AA, and I found myself telling my sponsor on the phone one day, I want to move to Los Angeles. They're on that crazy Venice speech with all those crazy people. I knew I took a glove and I've been wrong about it either. But on the Pacific Group, I want to look at UCLA in the operating room, you know, to their transplant teams, their heart and liver transplant teams. I want this and I want that. And every single of those things have come true for me. And those are all gifts from AA. I deserve none of those. I got on taking all of them. You know, before I sit down here tonight, we to live it all over again. You know, early on, my sponsor asked me, he says, Karen, where are you at with your spiritual program? He said, Alcoholics Thomas is a spiritual program, but where are you at? What, what, do you have a God in your life? What are you doing in that area? I said, I'm not doing anything. I don't believe in God. And he put up in the big book of Alcoholics Thomas and he showed me where I get a daily reprieve contingent on the spiritual maintenance of the power greater than myself. He went on to tell me there's going to come a day when I can't help you, A can't help you, and you had better well have a God in your life or you are dead in the disease of alcoholism. And I know that's very, very true because I've done it. I've, many times I've been in that position. Thank God I had a God by the time it happened. But So one more time I said the magic words to my sponsor. What do you want me to do? He said, I want you to get on your knees in the morning. I want you to get on your knees at night. And I want you to pray for God's will. Do not pray for things. Pray for God's will and the power to carry that out. And I started doing that, you guys. I didn't feel any connection with God. I felt like a fool doing it, you want the truth. And I talked to him every day on the phone. I still live in Nebraska. And I said, this is not working for me. And he says, are you staying sober one day at time in Alcoholics Thomas? I said, well, you know that I am. He said, that's the point of the whole thing. Are you stupid or what? I wasn't playing <laughs> with a full deck when I arrived here. It took me a long, long time to do those simple things. And I told my sponsor, I said, Clancy, what is God's will? He said, how the hell am I supposed to know? I'm not God. He said, but I have to believe when I'm not lying, stealing, and cheating, and I'm doing what God gives me to do, that is God's will. He said, do what's on your plate. Do what God gives you to do. Do what's in front of you. I thought, what is he talking about? He said, for you, why don't you start answering the phone when it rings? Just start with that, you know. I didn't have a phone when I first got sober. It took me a long time to get a phone in Alcoholics Thomas. By the time I answered, I sure didn't want to talk to him. It was bill collectors from all over the universe that wanted to talk to me. But, you know what, by answering that telephone and by dealing with those people, I'm $86,000 out of debt in this program. So, yeah, I started doing what was in front of me and stuff. And, and just to show you how important it is for me to answer that telephone, about 13 years ago, we had trouble nursing crisis in Southern California. We were working our butts off, let me tell you. I was always the first one to complain about it, I'm sorry to say. You were like the two hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I was a bitch is what I was. But this one particular week, I'd worked 72 hours, and, and uh, I worked the night shift over there. We do most of our transplants at night and stuff. And, and I went to the meeting early in the evening. I went home and I went to bed early. I had that night off, and I went home and I went to bed, and the phone rang about 2 o'clock in the morning. I thought, I am not answering that telephone. It's either somebody I sponsor wanting to whine about something, or it's work wanting me to come to work. And I'm not answering the phone. And my head told me, pick up the damn phone, somebody's in trouble. What is the matter with you? So I picked up the telephone, and I'm so glad I did. You guys, the most precious thing happened to me. And sure enough, it was my boss, and she said, I've got 18 people sick over here tonight. We do a liver transplant a little bit. It's about three years old. I have nobody to do it. Now get over here and help me. I know you work 72 hours. I don't want to hear it, Karen. I need you to come over here. I said, I can't even think straight. I'm so tired. And she said, I can't help it. You've got to come to work. And she hung the phone up. Well, I was going to call my sponsor, but I don't want to talk to him in nothing about 2 o'clock in the morning, I can tell you. But I know what he told me. Nobody ever died from lack of sleep, Karen. I say, well, there's a first time for everything, Clancy. You know, but <laughs> I just went to work, and I'm so glad I did. And I go there, and I sent my order upstairs to bring our little patient downstairs. And we had a jet coming from New York to deliver for this child. We had some time to kill and stuff. So my orderly called me in the back, and he said, you're not going to believe all the people of this family. And I thought, well, that's nice that they had the support. I was so crabby, you guys. And I went out front to get my little patient. And the first thing I noticed was the mother. She had the most beautiful blue eyes I've ever seen before in my life. And, and the dad was good looking and stuff. And there was about 75, 80 people in this family. I thought how highly unusual at 4 o'clock in the morning. How highly unusual any time you want to know the truth. And then I looked down at my little patient. And i got to tell you guys that Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me to love at a level I never, ever, ever dreamt possible myself. And I looked in the most beautiful blue eyes I've ever seen before in my life. And this little baby girl was so sick, she with her head off the pillow, she was so sick, and dying from some strange liver thing, and he was a transplant. And I remember thinking to myself, and you didn't want to be here, you selfish person. I thought, I'm going to be the best nurse I have ever been before in my life tonight. And by God, I was, too. And 
and her little arms, she had a little bear, and she had a blanket wrapped around that bear, hanging on him for dear life, and I'd been over and I talked to her, and I said, oh, you brought your little baby bear down to surgery, and tried to tell me her little bear was going to have a liver transplant, and I said, oh, you're both going to have one, and she said, no, no, just the bear, you know, but anyway, <laughs> we sent the family out the waiting room, and that mom was an absolute hysteric, so I got to tell you guys, and, and this little girl looked at me, and she said, why is my mommy crying? Go tell my mommy, mommy not to cry, and because of alcoholic is what I've learned in this program, I was able to tell that little girl the truth. Now, I said, your mommy's crying because your mommy loves you so very, very much, and she's worried about you. She says, go tell my mommy not to cry. And that seemed to settle her down a little bit and stuff. And, you know, we have an anesthesiologist at UCLA that loves to play with the kids. He is just a delight to work with. So, and she got her IV started. The bear got an IV started, and she thought that was real funny. And his, her, his bag was called bear juice. She thought that was real funny. And, and when she went to sleep, the bear went to sleep. It was really quite painless, to tell the truth. But i got to tell you guys that six-hour transplant did not go well. We almost lost that baby a couple times due to blood loss. I have never seen a team of people pull together like the other night for that baby. And six hours later, she went to her room with not much hope at all, I gotta tell you guys. She'd lost a tremendous amount of blood. And I became obsessed with this child and I had to see her again. <clears throat> we have a rule at UCLA. You may not get involved with these transplant patients. And where the organs come from, we cannot tell them. It's best not to see them after surgery. Now I'm telling anybody in this room tonight that I'm real good at breaking rules, aren't I? I thought, I'm just gonna go up and see how she's doing. I'm not gonna talk to anybody. <clears throat> so when she was six days post off from that transplant, I went to that baby's room. I went the door to that child's room. And you guys, I could not believe it was in front of my face. My God, the power of God, the power of God. Here was this little baby girl. It was the first time she got this surgery. She was jumping up and down in her crib. She had diapers hanging around her knees. She had that bear in one arm. She put band-aids all over this bear. He had band-aids on his eyes, his ears, his nose, and I mean everywhere. And I just stood in that hall, and I just cried like a baby. It is not cool to see the nursing staff ball, let me tell you. And had a whole room full of people in there. And something caught my eye out of the corner of my eye. And I'll be damned if our book wasn't sitting on that kid's dresser. And it all made sense to me now. And I was in that room like a flash. I didn't care if I got fired. And I said to Mom, I said, whose book is that? And she said, that's my book. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So was my husband. Her sponsor was there. His sponsor was there. And those 75, 80 people driven 500 miles to leave this family. They were not from the L.A. area. And they showed me one more time what this gig is all about. It's about love and service, and that's all it's about. And I was impressed, let me tell you. And I said, how long have you been sober? And she said, five years today. I thought, oh, my God, her baby up for the first time. What a fabulous birthday present was coming. And I walked to this little girl, and she stopped dead in her tracks. She said, go away. I'm not sick anymore. And I, <laughs> I had my, my scrub clothes on, and it scared the hell out of her. Well, then I said, I didn't come up here to hurt you. I came up here to see how you're doing. And, and you guys, she gave me her little bear, and she said, you take him home and take care of him. He's so sick and he needs a nurse to take care of him. I know she gave me the bear to get me the hell away from her, but I could pretend like she wanted me to have him. And I told the mom, I said, I can't take that baby's bear home. That bear was in a plastic bag by her little head her entire surgery. You really ought to keep this a memento. And she said, Karen, please take it. She's got 50 bears in here. She wants you to have it. Please take it. And she did indeed have 50 bears in that room. And I felt like a fool walking down the hall of that bear, but that bear was my most prized possession from the alcoholic psalmist for many, many years. They got to be too damned important to me. They got to be too important. We got to get rid of it, folks. My little granddaughter says to me, Grandma, can I have that bear? And I said, it's Grandma's bear, Brandy. And, uh, <laughs> and she says, uh, she knows the whole story. And, and she says, I said, Grandma will buy you a hundred bears. That's my bear. And she said, but I don't want a hundred bears. I want that bear. And I said, it's Grandma's bear. <laughs> I thought, I can't believe I said that to my granddaughter. But anyway, it got so bad for me, I talked to my sponsor about it. What's a 50-year-old woman talking to her sponsor about a bear for? <laughs> me and my sponsor told me, give her the damn bear and quit being so selfish. You got the memory. You got to give it away to keep it. Give her the bear. And I thought, I'm getting a different sponsor. That is the last damn thing. <laughs> I obviously didn't do that, but anyway, that bear sits in Lincoln, Nebraska on her dress for band-aids. In fact, I just visited him in August, and Brandy's now married. She has her own family, and she's taking very, very good care of my bear, let me tell you. But in that hospital room, I thought to myself, I need to reciprocate here. I obviously was not prepared for a birthday party. And I remember something that was in my pocket that my sponsor gave me when I was five years sober. It was a medallion for five years of sobriety. I was like nine years sober when this happened, and I hung out this thing for many years too long. I am a selfish woman, I'm sorry to say. I could not seem to find the woman that was special enough, in my opinion, to give my five-year medallion to. And I knew I'd found her, let me tell you. And I gave her that. And she said, Karen, I can't take that. My God, Clancy gave you that. And the reason I had that in my pocket at work at night, there's narcotic use next to that medallion. I am telling anybody in this room tonight, when I open that cupboard sometimes, my eyes light like firecrackers. I can grab that and remember where the hell I'm coming from here. But anyway, she said, oh, please, I can't. Clancy did. And I said, no, I want you to have it. 
And I really, really meant them. The nurses got wind of all this. We got a cake for the mother who celebrated her five years of sobriety. And I have to tell you guys, when I look back over my life, that has got to be one of the most magnificent days of my entire life. And you know what? I could have missed the whole damn thing. How many times have I not taken a simple action like picking up the telephone and I've missed stuff? That makes me crazy if I think about it long enough. But, you know, there's been no more contact with these people. It's got to be that way for many, many reasons. I know that little girl is doing very, very well and stuff. And, you know, people say to me all the time, why do you keep doing it, Jerem? Why do you keep doing it? And I know of no greater thing to say to them than where our 12th tradition says long form. So that this to the end, that my great blessings may ever spoil me, I may forever live in thankful contemplation of him who presides over us all. And there's more reasons than that for me. You're the ones that walk me when nobody else would walk with me. You held my hand when nobody else would hold my hand. And you told me that you loved me. And I need you as desperate as I need you in 1982. You taught me how to live. You taught me how to love. You taught me how to keep my pants up and all those things. And, and I don't do any of those things very well. But I'll tell you the one thing that I do with 200% absolute perfection, and that is this, that I love this program more than the whole world. And it's truly a story from an alcoholic hell I cannot even describe. I have truly been given, just like the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says, I have truly been given the keys to the kingdom. And I'm going to say one more thing, and I'm going to shut my mouth here right on time. It has been one hell of a walk from Skid Row, Nebraska. So I stand in Portland, Oregon, and I, I think that but for the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have missed it all. Thank you for having me. Thank you for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.